All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Jay Pandey, I'm a PGY3, and I'm gonna be talking to you guys about firearm injuries and the burden of this disease. Uh, we're kind of gonna go beyond the ED, beyond the bullet. Uh, this is part of the social EM lecture series. I just wanna give a special shout out. Thank you to Dr. Sim, Dr. Kristoff, and Dr. Lavadera, and the social EM team, uh, and Dr. Gore. So we're gonna go over the definition of firearm injuries today, take a little look into the history of the legislation uh, behind firearm gun violence, go into the statistics and numbers, talk about recidivism, the psychosocial impact, and then get into hospital-based intervention programs. So what is firearm injury defined as? Firearm injury is defined as a gunshot wound or penetrating injury from a weapon that uses a powder charge to fire a projectile. Now, this injury can be either categorized as either suicidal, homicidal, or unintentional if you categorize them by intent. So let's take a deeper dive into this. We can look at firearm injuries using a framework that was proposed by Hargarten et al. in a commentary on the biopsychosocial nature of gun violence. Um, so what you have is a high velocity bullet that transmits kinetic energy to the surrounding cells and tissues. Now this high velocity impact breaks down the cell membranes and causes the dis disruption and integrity of bone, nerves, solid organs, and what happens is a stress response is activated, both inflammatory, hormonal, psychological, uh, and you have this cavity formation, you lose a lot of barrier integrity. And downstream, you have organ dysfunction, psychological trauma, and high morbidity and mortality. So if you go through it like this, right? You have an etiology, you have the bullet, you have a pathogenesis, it, transmits kinetic energy to surrounding cells and tissues. And you get structural changes, right? You get the breakdown of your barriers, you get breakdown of the integrity of your bones, your hollow organs. And there's a clinical significance, the downstream effects that we talked about. So if you take a look at fire and violence like this in, in this manner, it's a condition of the humans, living animal species, and our body parts that impairs our normal function, and it's manifested by distinguishing signs and symptoms. So if you put this together, I would argue that firearm injury is a disease. So let's take a look at the history of gun violence research in America. In 1993, the New, York, New England Journal of Medicine published an article by uh, Arthur Kellerman and colleagues called gun ownership as a risk factor for homicide in the home. And it presented the results of research funded by the CDC, which found that keeping a gun in the home was strongly and independently associated with an increased risk of homicide. Now, this article concluded that rather than confer protection, guns kept in the home are associated with increased risk of homicide by a family member or intimate acquaintance. So what this resulted in in 1996 was the Dickey Amendment. Now, what the Dickey Amendment essentially did was ban CDC funding for gun violence research. Uh, I quote from the actual amendment, none of the funds made available for injury prevention and control of the CDC uh, may be used to advocate or promote gun control. So what this, taken, what this was interpreted as was basically that we can't use any federal funding for gun violence research. Fast forward to 19, sorry, 2011. Um, and you have the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which kind of doubled down on the Dickey Amendment and banned any NIH funding for gun violence research. So none of the funds made available in this title could be used whole or in part to advocate or promote gun control, uh, which was understood as gun violence research. Uh, and this was very much in part of thank you to the NRA's uh, advocacy efforts that led to this amendment being passed. Um, and this was all in response to a 2009 article, or it's thought to be in response to a 2009 article uh, in the American Journal of Public Health, uh, which was titled Investigating the Link Between Gun Possession and Gun Assault, which presented results of research that was funded by the NIH at that time. And several years later in 2019, we kind of had a turnover of years of 
ban on federal funding for gun violence research. And this was through the omnibus spending bill, which basically redefined the language in the Dickey Amendment. And it was clarified stating that while federal funding cannot be used to promote gun control, that this does not mean that it can't be used towards research for injury prevention and gun violence uh, research is included in injury prevention. And surprisingly enough, this was uh, signed by Donald Trump, who was our president then. The result of this was astounding. So $25 million were allocated in the budget in 2020 towards gun violence research compared to the only 100,000 that were allocated in the prior years. So if we look at firearm related deaths now, in 2019, there were 39,000 deaths uh, related to gun violence and firearm, uh, firearm uh, related injuries, which is about 109 deaths uh, per day in America. Now males accounted uh, for 86% of these victims. Um, in America, there's about an estimated 250 deaths so this is the United States. Globally, there's about an estimated 250 deaths per year uh, secondary to gun violence. In 2019, so nationally it was 39,000. If we break it down, New York State saw 804 deaths from this with Kings County seeing 73. Um, all in all, firearm injuries resulted in $48 billion in medical and work loss cost annually and non-fatal injuries that required hospitalization cost about an average of $30,000. And those that could be discharged uh, from the ED cost about $2,500. So there's a both, um, there's kind of this big uh, medical and work loss that's uh, attributable to gun violence as well. The leading cause of death amongst African-American men ages 15 through 34 is homicide due to firearms. Um, and firearm violence disproportionately impacts the African-American population. If you take a look at the age distribution here, Black youth are more burdened by firearm injuries than all other races combined. And then furthermore, there's a difference in intent as well. So if you look at, uh, if you break it down by race again, 81% of firearm injuries involving uh, the Black population were with an intent of homicide, whereas other races combined or for suicide with 76%. So I wanna move the conversation along to recidivism. recidivism. Uh, so recidivism is a tendency of a criminal offender to reoffend. It's a significant issue for firearm offenders who are involved in a firearm injury. A 2011 US Sentencing Commission report highlights the trends in recidivism for people released from incarceration or sentenced to a term of probation in 2010, and compared to those that were released or sentenced to probation in 2005. And the report was based on 250 federal offenders who were released in 2005. And of those, 3,446 were firearm related, which is about 13%, whereas the other 86% were not related to firearm injuries. The research found that firearm offenders recidivate at a higher rate than non-firearm offenders, with 68% being arrested for a new and more serious crime within an eight-year follow-up, compared to 46 for non-firearm related offenders. They also recidivate quicker at an average of 17 months after release versus uh, 22 months for non-firearm related offenders. And these rates span all age groups and comprises more of African-Americans compared to an equal split between white and African-Americans in the non-firearm group. And this just summarizes that data. So the question begs why? Why does this happen? Why is the burden of disease of firearm injury so high and why are patients of color so disproportionately affected by this disease? The answer is multifactorial and lies beyond the trauma bay. It land, lies beyond our rare and infrequent two minute conversation with the patient, educating them that violence is not the answer without for most of us having any personal experience of actually having lived through that kind of trauma and its aftermath. The truth is the burden of this disease persists much beyond the initial bullet impact and much beyond the hospital stay. The biological effects of gun violence you have the direct trauma, uh, the actual gunshot wound, the actual penetrating injury. 
you have the stress response that the body goes through, then you have the surgical complications, ICU complications, followed by dietary changes, possible ostomy bags, a change in lifestyle. You have frequent multi-specialty clinic follow-ups that this patient has to go through afterwards. And for a lot of these patients, disability. There's also psychological effects, PTSD, stress reactions, and reintegration, the stress of reintegrating into society with a new disability, with a colostomy bag, having to go see friends and family again after having gone through this. And then the social effects and challenges, which encompass returning to the same violent environment they might have come from without any choice of having a different option. Job instability, uh, having to find a new job afterwards to say, leave the gang activity they might've been involved in out of no choice. They might've been the only source of income to having to go back to that now. Uh, transportation to appointments, having to register for an ID to get transportation. Maybe they need a driver's license. They need identification cards that they don't have to even get the services that they require. Substance use resources and then housing and food instability issues. So what we have to address all these multifactorial needs of our patients after the initial impact, after the initial injury, are we have this creation of hospital-based violence intervention programs, which embrace the public health approach to violence intervention and prevention. And this is grounded in the data that indicates that victims of interpersonal violence are at an elevated risk for re-injury, are susceptible to engaging in retaliatory violence as well. There's been multiple evaluations on hospital-based intervention programs uh, that have shown that their reach goes and includes preventing injury, preventing violent crime, uh, preventing re-involvement within the justice system, substance misuses, and decreasing PTSD symptoms. These programs, uh, they assess and kind of treat the individual at a personal level, uh, takes into account their relationships with their environment, with their peers, kind of goes beyond that and they go out into the community, do outreach work, and then work on the policy and advocacy level as well. So more on the societal level. They kind of, they use teachable moments. Uh, the, they're specialists that are trained in these hospital violence intervention programs. Uh, so these, these teachable moments, which are kind of defined as these rare opportunities where the individuals are particularly receptive to interventions that are gonna promote positive behavior changes. And there's been several studies that have de demonstrated the effectiveness of interventions in these healthcare settings that are done by uh, intervention specialists. They are many times from the communities where patients come from, uh, have the trust of community leaders, uh, church leaders, uh, school youth group leaders, um, and kind of take their work from the ED to the inpatient floor and out to the community after the patient's discharge and follow them through. Uh, there's been several, to date, five uh, random risk control trials uh, taking a look at the effectiveness of these programs. Three of them didn't have enough of a sample size to come up with any significant conclusion. There was one that was done in Chicago that followed 180 youths and young adults, though. Uh, after a violent injury, they were randomized to receive services uh, or a control group, which didn't. And the study found that there was significantly less, the patients were significantly less likely to report uh, being a victim of violence during a six-month follow-up after the initial hospital treatment. And 20% uh, of the control group reported repeat injury compared to only 8% of the intervention program. So let's talk about our intervention program that we have at Kings County Hospital. This is CAVI, which is um, our hospital-based intervention program that was started by our attending Dr. Gore. Um, and they, the organization approaches this in a similar fashion to what I spoke about earlier. They follow the same model as other hospital-based intervention programs. So the first one you have is actual hospital-based intervention. There's uh, hospital responders that will follow up when the patients are admitted uh, to the SICU or the trauma floor. Um, and they work with social workers to identify the patient's need upon returning back to their community upon discharge. And they'll help connect them with resources, follow them up after discharge, follow them up in the community to make sure that they have access to transportation to get to their appointments, that they have the identification and other documents they need to get the services that they need. Uh, and they'll make referrals to certain follow-up services, whether it's for food or housing instability or helping the patient get a job or, uh, and get, become more financially stable. The second is a community program. 
Uh, so this is where they engage with community leaders, church leaders, uh, youth group leaders, and kind of help connect the patients uh, beyond just their personal visits. And lastly, there's prevention in school. So there's a school-based curriculum that's been developed as a three-week program. A lot of our residents have in the past have taken part in going to these uh, programs and kind of helping teach the modules which address racial and social injustice, restorative justice, and trauma-informed care. And these are usually led by peer counselors and facilitators. Uh, they help these students, usually middle and high school students with relationships, family situations, professional development, um, professional growth, kind of uh, the other parts of schooling life that we might not address directly from our like hospital intervention. Kavi's violence program is based off of the cure violence model, which was actually started in Chicago and was one of the first uh, programs there. And the goal of this program was to stop the spread of violence by using methods and strategies that were associated with disease control. So one is detection, right? Detecting and interrupting conflict. So this is where they have trained mediators identifying and mediating potentially lethal conflicts in the community, following up to ensure that the conflict doesn't ignite. And the next is identifying and treating the highest risk individuals. Uh, so you have these trained uh, outreach workers that work with the highest risk uh, groups to kind of make them less likely to commit violence. They meet with them where they're at, they talk to them about issues, whether there's family, family issues going on, issues with school, education, getting a job, and help them kind of a, obtain the social services they might need, um, including like job training, drug treatment, et cetera. And lastly, they address changing social norms. So this is where, again, engaging leaders in the community, uh, residents, local business owners, faith leaders, and conveying the message to these group leaders that, you know, hey, as a community, we have to spread this message that we're not gonna support the use of violence and that there's other ways to kind of go about and address the needs that our community has. So what can we do? One of our recent grads, Jordan Dow, uh, did his senior lecture on trauma-informed care, so I'm not gonna go into it with too much detail, but I think it's definitely worth a brief discussion here. Uh, trauma-informed care is an approach that basically to, it's an approach to care that shifts the focus on what's wrong with the patient from what's wrong with the patient to what happened to them. It's a framework for organizations and care teams to address the patient's complete life situation, both past and present, to provide a more comprehensive care. Uh, the patient experience, you think about it, it it's gonna start with that first interaction, whether it's with the triage nurse, EMS, or the front desk clerk. And it goes all the way through to the techs, the nurses, the doctors, environmental services, radiology techs, uh, ancillary staff, surgical staff, and well beyond our ED. And so trauma-informed care approaches the care to a patient incorporating all the people that will interact with the patient uh, using six different principles, which are safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration, engagement, and humility and responsiveness. And the goal of this is to understand the impact of the trauma and the paths to recovery, recognizing the signs and symptoms of the trauma for patients and their families, integrating this knowledge into policies and our practice, and then actively avoiding, which I think this is huge, actively avoiding re-traumatization. And so in the case of firearm violence, which dips disproportionately impacts the youth, uh, the effects are pervasive and long-term. And there've been multiple studies done to show that reveal that there, there's a greater risk of chronic medical conditions, health risk behaviors for patients who've experienced a traumatic event, including substance use, STIs, COPD, lung disease, heart disease, depression, autoimmune disorders, uh, disorders and attempted suicide. So, Trauma-informed care is a way that we can all kind of help address this issue in our daily practice. Um, and it's just not us, it's, you know, we can involve our nurses, our staff. You see an interaction going a wrong way, you see a patient not responding the way you would expect them to. It might be because they might be getting re-traumatized, right? There might be a lack of trust in the healthcare system because of the prior experience they've had. Or PD being around might make them more wary of opening up to you. So these are things that we all have to be kind of hyper aware of, especially in our CCT setting where we see a lot of our trauma patients coming through. And so what can we do? At the organizational hospital level, at our departmental level, 
we can engage the patients in organizational planning, uh, have them be part of committees that work on these hospital policies. We can train clinical and non-clinical staff in this trauma and care informed care model and just create a safer environment for our patients based on the policies that we have at the hospital. This goes on not just to us, but training all the different staff. And then for us individually in our individual interactions, right? Include the patient in the treatment process. Uh, tell them what you're doing, tell them why you're doing it. Um, I had one trauma patient in CCT with a gunshot wound who we were giving fentanyl to, you do that. And there was, he was not happy with that at all. He thought we were trying to get him addicted. He, he was just really upset uh, at the providers. And it took a conversation of where his fear was coming from. And his brother had, had been an opioid abuser and that's where his fear was coming from. And so for him, fentanyl meant addiction and death. And so having that conversation, having offering different options for even pain control or having them understand here, this is one dose that's gonna help you out throughout this, incorporating our patients into our actual treatment plans for them. Uh, screening patients we might think are high risk for trauma and screening them for trauma, screening them for any interpersonal violence uh, in our peds department, screening them for any uh, abuse at school. And then lastly, engaging resources and referrals through social work and CAVI. Usually what the pathway for this is we get social work involved with any patient that is a victim of interpersonal violence, is a victim of uh, penetrating injury of any sort, whether it's stabbing, shooting, firearm violence. We put in a social work referral. Um, we should be doing that for all patients uh, with the goal of them referring these patients to CAVI. Um, they send the MR numbers to CAVI and they're Kavi has a team that will follow up with these patients. You guys have any questions? That was a great talk. Thank you, Dr. G. There's no comment on the you mentioned about the MSPD. I feel like everyone should feel empowered to kind of talk to the MSPD after the week when you're talking to patients, when you're suturing patients, when you're when you're managing them. Um, obviously you should just feel unsafe, that's one thing, but um, I think the team must be allowed that that might be part of the patient's care. Feel empowered to do that for the doctors work from for everyone on Zoom, that was Dr. Willis just saying, um, we should all feel empowered to kind of take control of our room, ask NYPD to step out when we're treating our patients, when we're suturing their wounds, because um, they might linger around. So us having that agency to tell them that we need our privacy with our patients. Yeah, I was gonna say, oftentimes I feel like patients sometimes come in and it may seem that they're acting irrational, right? Or upset with you, especially if they're under police custody. Um, and, you know, they've been harmed, right, and they're under arrest, and they, they feel like, I'm the victim here, like, why am I, I'm being arrested, I've been assaulted, <laughs> and now I'm here in the hospital, right, and sometimes what I do is, uh, I'll ask them to step out, and I'll say, you know, I'm so sorry, I don't know what the circumstances were that happened, and I'm sorry that you're here under these conditions, and we're just here to take care of you, but I want to make sure that your health is okay, right, and I'm not here to side with NYPD, and I make that very clear to them, like, I don't reveal any of your, your health information to NYPD, but mm -hmm. I'm here to make sure that you're safe, and usually that's enough to, like, establish a good relationship with them, and I absolutely, as long as I feel safe with the patient, and usually that's the case, right, I ask NYPD to step out of take care and talk to them, and if I feel like they're, like, cuffed, and it's, like, uh, restricting my ability to examine them, right? Because sometimes I had a patient who had a fracture, a hepatotumoral uh, fracture, and their arm was cuffed to the bed, and it was like very obvious. And I was just like, I, I had to like, you know, don't be afraid to ask them what you to recuff a different extremity, right? Like sometimes they don't, they're not medical providers, they don't examine the patient, right? And so don't be afraid to, to ask them to, yeah. to do those things. Um. For everyone at, on Zoom, um, Stephanie was saying, don't be afraid to kind of ask NYPD to step out of the room and set yourself apart from the PD team saying, you know, I'm here to take care of you. I apologize for the circumstances that they're there under and just let them know that you're not there to side with the cops that brought them in there. Um, and then that can help gain a better rapport with the patients. Thank you. Thank you.